This film was made by Neville Govett between 1933 and 1939. Made at his own expense, Mr Govett even paid his fare for the privilege of travelling on the trams to make this unique visual record of Melbourne's disappearing cable tramways. In the early days, the conductor used a bell punch to perforate a trip slip into his uniform. When the trip slip was punched, a little bell rang to tell the passenger that his fare was recorded. The punch was fitted with a combination lock, and all the punched out parts of the trip slip were gathered inside the punch. When the conductor paid in his takings, the bell punch was opened, and the confetti was tallied with the money received. Here, the filmmaker gets into the act. The cables were uncoiled out of the ship's hold and loaded onto a convoy of horse-drawn lorries. These scenes were filmed by Neville Govett at Victoria Dock about 5pm. He remembers the horses walking slowly to the engine house in the early hours of the morning and the pride the men took in their work. The cables came in continuous lengths. The largest one was about six miles long and weighed over 30 tonnes. Splicing was required when a new cable had to be joined to form an endless rope and when a worn cable needed repairing. The splice extended over a length of 80 feet and normally took seven men about two hours to complete. The cable, or rope as it was called, consisted of six strands, each of seven wires, wrapped around a hempen core. When a new cable was installed, it was saturated with a rope filler. It was then automatically lubricated with rope oil once or twice daily to prevent rust. The underground cables were powered by stationary steam engines located in engine houses dotted around the system. The tall engine house chimneys were conspicuous Melbourne landmarks. These scenes are of the engine house at the corner of Gertrude Street and Nicholson Street, Fitzroy. This engine house was the last one used in Melbourne. Marvelling at the massive engine house machinery, the Argus newspaper in 1885 reported, the huge pieces run so smoothly that by using a lever attached to the large flywheel, with the left hand only, the whole mass is set in motion. While passing through the engine house, the continuous cable was wound around large driving wheels and a longer race which regulated its tension using an adjustable counterweight. This was necessary because of temperature variation, cable stretching and the continually varying load on the cable exerted by the trams at any one moment. The condition of the cable was continually monitored to detect flaws which may cause trouble and interrupt the tram service. The cable was led in and out of the engine house by large horizontal wheels located below the roadway outside the building. Here we see the conductor pulling a cord which operated a conical drum pulley to raise the moving cable into the jaws of the grip. These underground shots were taken in the large pits outside the engine house and show the tram grips releasing and engaging the constantly moving cable. Alarm signal pillars were sighted at regular locations along the routes so the tram crews could warn the engine house of problems associated with the cable. The messages were relayed by telegraphic ticker tape. In some cases it was necessary to either slow down or even stop the cable completely. A broken grip or badly frayed cable would necessitate such drastic action. This signal box is in the turret of the Gertrude Street engine house the large levers operated signals to control the passage of trams through the street intersection below. Here, on an early version of the grip, a gripman demonstrates how the cable was ejected from the grip jaws or dies. 
The only view that passengers had of the grip was the lever and quadrant positioned in the middle of the dummy or grip car. A strong and experienced gripman could bring the tram to maximum speed in a matter of seconds by skillful operation of the grip lever. The pulleys supporting the cable in the tunnel and guiding it around the curves were greased regularly via manholes beside the track. With the sun in the right position, it was possible to see the cable through the slot in the roadway. Before going into service, trams were run over a pit for examination and adjustment of working parts. The trams were moved from one track to another in the shed on traverser tables. Cars were periodically rotated on a turntable to allow equal exposure of the body panels to sun and weather. While the dummy was in the shed, the grip was raised up and rested on the floor of the vehicle. Trapdoors in the roadway outside the depot allowed the grip to be inserted and removed from the cable tunnel. When the tram came out onto the road, the grip was lowered through the trapdoor by means of a block and tackle. Here, the conductor lifts the cable into the grip by dangling a hook into the slot and hauling the rope upward. Each tram comprised an open vehicle called the dummy and an enclosed car which trailed behind. The dummy carried the grip mechanism which was operated by the gripman. The original speed of the trams was 8 miles an hour, but over a period of years it was increased to 13 miles an hour to keep pace with the growing motor traffic. Even at this speed, agile passengers could board or alight a moving tram without difficulty. White marble strips set into the roadway between the rails indicated where the gripman was obliged to either throw or pick up the cable. It was the conductor's duty to lift the cable into the grip at certain locations, change the points, go ahead of the tram and signal the gripman through particular intersections, as well as collect the fares. All this, and young boys intent on avoiding the affair, kept him constantly on the move. The front seat on the dummy was the most coveted seat of all. A breezy ride along St Kilda Road on the open dummy on a warm summer evening was a special treat recalled by many. When rounding sharp street corners, dummy passengers were cautioned by the gripman to mind the curve. On reaching their destination, the two vehicles forming the tram had to be shunted so that the dummy containing the grip was at the front end for the return journey. As the tram approached the terminus, the vehicles were uncoupled and by momentum they crossed to the other track in a reverse order. At the end of the day, the grip was lifted out of the slot and the trams were manhandled into the shed. Here at Brunswick, where longer and heavier cars were employed, horses were used to haul them in. When the cable lines were abandoned, many trams were sold and carted away. One by one, the massively built cable lines were dismantled and new electric tramways took their place. Here we see workmen cutting off the iron yokes which formed the underground cable tunnel. In recalling the closure of the last cable line in 1940, Mr Alf Twentyman mused that Never again would the city streets resound to the clanging of the dummy bells or hear the conductor's injunction to mind the curve. The neat little cars that served Melbourne so faithfully had passed into history. This commentary, compiled and produced by Robert Green and Anne Moyer, has been dubbed onto the original silent film for an exhibition commemorating the centenary of Melbourne's tramways, 11th of November 1985.